Hi everyone! Today I'm going to talk to you about something slightly different. Uh, instead of telling you about how certain tanks were designed, I'm going to tell you about how they were used. Now, if you read a lot of uh, English language books that were originally based on memoirs by German commanders written after the war, the view of Soviet tactics is a little bit one-sided. Obviously that is quite far from the truth, uh, so I decided to make a video, or most likely a series of videos, uh, talking about how, well, how the Red Army actually used its tanks in battle. And uh, let's start with uh, the tank brigade. So what is a tank brigade? A tank brigade is the smallest tactical unit uh, available in the Red Army. So there were two different kinds. Uh, there was the independent tank brigade, which was subordinate to the army commander uh, and would usually be assigned to a uh, infantry division as, as needed. Uh, and there was a tank brigades that were permanently attached to mechanized corps or tank corps. Tank brigades were designed primarily either for breakthrough action or pursuit, uh, mobile things like that. Uh, they weren't really built for defenses. Uh, usually defenses, uh, especially in early 1942, they were based on uh, artillery and entrenched infantry rather than tanks. Throughout the Great Patriotic War, the Red Army formed various different kinds of tank brigades that differed in size and the kinds of tank used, but the general principles of how the tank brigades used remained. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, tank brigades formed in February of 1942. Uh, so this was uh, the uh, immediately after, you know, the 1941, that was not a particularly good year for the Red Army. Um, most of the pre-war tanks were lost, so in forming new tank brigades, the majority of the tanks were new ones, so KVs, T-34s, and T-60s. Alright, so when it came to the tank brigade, the authorized strength, uh, as given in State Committee of Defense Decree Number 1295SS, uh, it of course began with uh, an HQ, and this contained 43 people. And the HQ, uh, in order to you know do its job properly, had a command company subordinate to it. So this is 142 people, consisted of a recon platoon, a signals platoon, an engineering platoon, and a quartermaster platoon. And of course, what kind of a tank uh, brigade are you going to have without tanks? Uh, a tank brigade formed in February of 1942 had two tank battalions, uh, with 146 people apiece. Uh, each battalion had three companies in it. There was a KV tank company with five KV-1 tanks uh, and 47 people in total. There was a T-34 tank company with 10 T-34 tanks and 48, 48 people. And there was a T-60 tank company with eight T-60 tanks and 17 people. Uh, and the brigade also had a technical company to support all of these tanks with 108 people in it. Now, the biggest difference between this and earlier tank units is that uh, there was um, a lot more attention paid to components that were not just tanks. Uh, the tank brigade also had an A artillery battery with 58 people in it and an anti-tank artillery battery that had four 76mm guns and 52 people. Uh, another addition was the motorized rifle company, which had 402 people, which was more than a third of the total number of people in the uh, tank brigade. So as I mentioned before, uh, the tank brigade was mostly an offensive uh, type unit, and preparations for an offensive would begin as many as 10 to 12 days before the fact. Uh, scouts would be sent to... Uh, you know, perform reconnaissance, examine terrain, uh, sap rays would prepare for scenes and wooden logs or beams. These would actually be stashed uh, near the obstacles that the tanks would have to cross during the offensive so they could be quickly retrieved. Um, and uh, of course the tanks would train with infantry quite extensively. Uh, so a number of assault groups would be chosen from whatever uh, infantry unit is supporting the tank brigade. Um, and here's a, an interesting um, in interesting change from the tactics in 1941. In 1941, tank units were subordinate to infantry commanders. 
Uh, infantry commanders, as a rule, had a very poor understanding of a tank's strengths and weaknesses, and so tanks would usually be sent to perform impossible tasks that uh, resulted in losses. In 1942, the tactics manual explicitly stated that a, a tank unit is not subordinate to an infantry unit. It is subordinate to the same commander that the unit reports to, uh, and assigning a tank unit to an infantry unit simply means that they are working on the same objectives. So the uh, infantry uh, rifle division commander could not give orders to a tank brigade commanders directly. So as I mentioned, um, eight, between 18 and 20 assault groups are chosen from the supporting infantry unit, uh, and in the preceding days to the offensive, these assault groups uh, participate in very close quarters training with the tanks. Uh, they train to uh, follow the tanks, have the tanks block pillboxes or enemy machine gun nests so they can approach, uh, pointing out targets, stuff like that. Um, the tankers were, were trained to tow uh, artillery, since these assault groups do include cannons, um, and it's quite uh, difficult for infantry to push guns and keep up with any kind of motorized vehicle on their own. Uh, in the meantime, of course, since the Germans didn't find out that these tanks had retreated to the rear of the train, uh, on the front lines, fake tanks would be uh, would be built, and in in each region you would have, uh, in addition to these fake tanks, you would have two or three real tanks driving around, uh, and, and, and the really their objective was just to create noise, leave tracks in the mud, um, just sort of increase the realism uh, and convince the Germans that the tanks were indeed still uh, in the front lines. So it's the day of the offensive. The battle is about to start. You have the uh, pathways through minefields are marked, and all of the uh, obstacles that the engineers noticed during their reconnaissance have been identified, and tactics have been uh, figured out how to negotiate them, and so the offensive can actually begin. The first step is the first echelon. The first echelon contains between 8 and 10 KV tanks. Now remember, this is the uh, spring or winter of 1942. Uh, the Germans, really the only thing that they have to defeat the KV-1's uh, front armor are heavy uh, anti-aircraft guns. Uh, and these guns are going to be quite rare uh, and quite, easy, uh, quite difficult to conceal. So the point of these KV tanks is well, to, to tank it out. Uh, the idea of the first echelon is that the enemy's anti-tank guns are forced to reveal themselves and shoot at the KV. The KV's armor is essentially impenetrable. Um, and these KV tanks are followed by uh, the assault groups. Uh, so these assault groups have they have with them, they have engineers, they have artillery, uh, they have infantry squads. So these assault groups uh, can, you know, they safeguard the tanks from uh, anti-tank guns and whatnot. The importance of the first echelon was quite high, uh, and so if a KV tank was disabled, um, it was imperative that a T-34 tank from the second echelon come up as quickly as possible in order to replace it. Uh, because of this, all KV tanks had to have tactical markings painted on the back, uh, so the T-34 tanks could identify them from uh, the second echelon. And speaking of the second echelon, this, uh, this wave contained about 15 to 20 T-34 tanks, and they followed the KVs at a range of 300 to 400 meters. Now they T-34 wasn't as impervious frontally to uh, German anti-tank guns as the KV was, uh, but about an extra three to 400 meters of distance gave them a pretty good chance of survival if shot at. Uh, now, the idea of the second echelon was that they would support the KV tanks with fire, uh, so any German anti-tank guns or concentrations, concentrations of infantry um, that were discovered, the T-34s are going to shoot at. The T-34s uh, are also accompanied by the main body of infantry, so really uh, they, uh, this, this is the wave that can hold ground, whereas the KV tanks really only have small specialized assault groups with them uh, that, whose goal is to get rid of uh, impediments in the KV tanks way. 
Now we get to the T-60 tanks. The T-60 tanks can't really duke it out with uh, German anti-tank artillery, so they are relegated to the third echelon. The third echelon follows between 100 and 150 meters behind the T-34s. Uh, their job is to mop up after the first two echelons, um, so stri infantry stragglers, uh, remaining anti-tank gun crews. Uh, this echelon is also used as... Um, um, means against German counterattacks. So uh, once you've gotten deep enough into enemy defenses, you know you might get hit from the side. That's where you use a T60 tank. There is a bit of a caveat: uh, the T60 is not particularly a powerful tank. So if a large enemy counterattack is detected, uh, the manual states uh, 30 to 50 tanks is sufficiently large. The entire tank brigade seizes its offensive um, and focuses on deflecting this attack uh, by firing from ambush when possible. In addition to the first three echelons, which was the main body of the attack, you have a uh, fourth echelon of T-60 tanks uh, carrying the second half of the infantry. Uh, and this is also used as a mobile reserve to uh, either mop up after the, the main body of the attack or to defend against counterattacks. Uh, the overall, the tank brigade, um, the attack is between a kilometer and a kilometer and a half deep and it is situated on a front between 1200 meters and 1800 meters wide. If there are two tank brigades, they have to attack side by side in order to keep that concentration of force up uh, on a front between three kilometers and four kilometers wide. And if you have three tank brigades in one place, then two tank brigades are going to be used in the attack and one tank brigade is going to be used as a reserve. Now, the T-60 tank was a little bit of a special case. Uh, this role in Soviet tank units, the infantry support light tank, uh, it was supposed to be filled by the T-50 tank. However, the T-50 tank proved quite complicated uh, and expensive to build. It was essentially cost as much as a T-34 tank, but it was not as good as a T-34 tank. Um, and so, uh, shortly after the war broke out, it was replaced by the T-60. The T-60, it was not a very powerful tank. Uh, its armament consisted of a 20mm autocannon, uh, its tracks were quite narrow, its off-road mobility was limited, uh, and so it earned derision from many Red Army commanders fairly quickly, uh, which as you can imagine had a detrimental effect on the morale of the crews. Uh, the Red Army High Command noticed this and you know, of course, you can't have this kind of treatment of one of your own tanks. Uh, so special instructions were issued in the spring of 1942 uh, telling commanders how to use their tanks more effectively. So the idea was that uh, there was no attempt made to hide the tank's weaknesses. Uh, these weaknesses, of course, as I mentioned, were a very small gun, poor off-road mobility. The armor was not thick enough to withstand direct fire by anti-tank guns. Uh, but it, it wasn't supposed to do that anyway. Uh, these tanks were really designed to, like I mentioned before, fight in the second, uh, third or fourth echelon. Um, they would not be used independently except in uh, very specific cases like pursuit. And there was a note that even uh, during pursuit of the retreating enemy with T-60 tanks, cooperation between the tanks and infantry or cavalry was paramount so all of these tanks don't run into an ambush and are lost um, and also this pursuit could only happen when the main enemy lines of defense were breached uh, in case the enemy had deeply echelon defenses the t-60 tanks were supposed to have a limit to their advance after which they would allow the medium and heavy tanks to catch up and uh, break through any kind of difficulties uh, that lay ahead. And there you have it. Now you know how to command a Soviet tank brigade in battle.